Well, hi, everybody. If you're new, my name's Chuck. I'm one of the pastors here. Really glad you're with us today. Thanks for making this a part of your Sunday. If you have a Bible, if you want to open up to John chapter 11, we're on page 897. The Bibles that are under your chairs and around the room. And uh, we'll be diving in there in just a second. So one of the things I get asked a lot as a pastor is, what do you do all week? Okay, you know, it's like, oh, it must be nice to work one day a week and all that. Yeah, that's not funny. Um, <laughs> lots of different things, you know, uh, and all that. But one of the things that pastors, you know, they're known for is they, they preach sermons. Uh, they do, you know, they have pastoral counseling or pastoral meetings, things like that. But we're really known for weddings and funerals. And so I do, I've done a lot of weddings and funerals over the years. Weddings are fun. They're usually fun, you know, because people of all ages have done weddings with people of all ages, declaring their love for each other, their dependence on God for a marriage. And that's just great. Sometimes there's drama. Uh, you know, sometimes that's usually involving the parents of the bride or the groom. But usually it's just fun. You get a lot of fun. And then there's funerals. And funerals, of course, are not, are not so fun. Uh, funerals, you know, are probably, you know, they used to be my least favorite thing to do when I was younger. Uh, you know, it was just a very sad time. And, you know, especially if I didn't know the person, if I didn't know, like, if the person was a Christian or not or anything about it, those, were, those were very hard things. So I had this thought one day when I was, do, I was about to do this funeral, and I hadn't done one in a while, and I had this thought come to me, I want to acknowledge the elephant in the room with the funeral and see how it goes. And I never went back. I do it at all my funerals. I basically have a moment where I look at everybody and go, no one wants to be here. Funerals are uncomfortable. They're supposed to be. Our culture says death's a part of life. Our culture's wrong. Because we all know that we shouldn't be here. Whoever's in the casket, young, old, Long time illness, short tragic tragedy, this shouldn't have happened. The, the sadness we all feel, it's, it's not supposed to be here. And so yes, we remember people, we, we celebrate their life, but that, that longing of, I don't like this, and it, this doesn't seem right, that's actually in you because you were made in the image of God. And according to the biblical story, when we were created, when humanity was first created, death wasn't a part of the story. Death came into the picture because sin entered in the world. And the wages of sin, what sin brings ultimately, is death. And so... Even though we all don't like to think about our death and our funeral one day, although funerals are a gift in that regard, it makes you think about maybe your last day. And if your last day is quicker than you think, how are you preparing for that day? That uncomfortable feeling that this isn't right is actually something we're going to see today Jesus speak to, confront, and give us hope for in John chapter 11. We're in our third week in our series, True North, as we're looking at how Jesus points us to true north. We're not just going to let the pull of our culture pull us any which way, but we're looking to Jesus to be our compass of what is meaning and purpose in life and, and what is what do we really want to be pointed toward. And we're learning that from different passages in the gospel of John. So John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. Now it's interesting here that he mentions uh, Mary and Martha because um, they haven't been introduced in John's gospel. They were introduced in Luke's gospel, and many of you have been around the Bible before. There's a famous story about Mary and Martha where Jesus is teaching, Mary is sitting at his feet, Martha's working in the kitchen, and she's upset about that and all that. You can look that up. That's in Luke chapter 10. Uh, that's, but John is supposing that you know who they are, that they're Jesus' friends and, and that. In fact, he's going to tell you something that he's not going to tell you the story until we read this story next week. Uh, it was Mary, in verse 2, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So John has this idea that my readers know who I'm talking about. In fact, he'll tell us this story um, at the beginning of chapter 12 next week. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so the Son of Man be glorified through it. So they get a message to him. 
They, they, your friend Lazarus, this, this guy that you love, he's, he's, he's sick. He's ill. And not just ill. Apparently that, you know, he's sick and like you need to get here. But notice what Jesus is saying. This illness does not lead to death. This is kind of this prophetic moment, a prophecy from Jesus that he's saying, here's what's coming. So verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, I don't know if you, let's read that again, because that's a very shocking statement. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he teleported to Bethany and, and healed him. It's not what he says. He loved him, so he stayed two days longer. That is, that's crazy. Because you would think, no, 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 no. Hey, somebody needs your help. Well, I should act quickly. Somebody needs your help. I think I'll take a two-day holiday. You know, like, what is happening here? But remember, he's already said, this is not going to end in death. This is going to end in the glory of God. This is going to end in God showing um, who I am, who the Son of God is. And so he stays. This is a very, very important concept that we see from the heart of Jesus in these two verses. And the concept is this. God's delays do not always mean God's denials. <clears throat> that many times we, can, we, we go through life and we ask God to do something big. We ask God to do something. And we need to remember that he loves us, but he has a bigger plan than our immediate comfort. He has a bigger plan than just, you know, doing whatever we think is the right move, next move. He knows what the right next move is. And so he loved them. So he stayed. His delays are not his denials. Verse 7. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there? Now, for the last three weeks, we've been talking about these statements that Jesus has made, these I am statements. The first week in the series, I am the lie of the world. Last week, I am the good shepherd. All of those statements are heavily contested and very upsetting to the Jewish leaders, to the Pharisees, religious leaders. And uh, several times during these stories, they're like, we, we should kill him. We should stone him because he's committing blasphemy. He is equating equality with God. He is saying that he is the great I am uh, in these statements. And so uh, you can go back and look at different paragraphs that we didn't get a chance to focus on, but they're, they're seeking to kill him. And they're like, why would we go back there? They're trying to kill you. Verse nine, Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the lie of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. He's like, these guys don't know what they're doing. I know what I'm doing. I'm led by the light. I'm the light of the world. We don't need to worry about that. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest in sleep. I love that John's just honest, like they weren't, they weren't tracking with him. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. That's how I hear him saying it. He may not say that. I, it's kind of like, well, if he's asleep, he's dead. You know, you know, he's not mostly dead. He's dead, you know, and all that. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now this is doubting Thomas that you've probably heard of before that won't believe that Jesus rose from the dead unless he puts his hands in his wounds. It's actually in John's gospel that Thomas says that and we'll, we'll get to that way down the road here. But I love Thomas basically it's like, you know, uh, almost every commentary, you know, I read these uh, scholars who have done all this analysis of John, all that, almost every commentary I read, you know, they have all these technical lingos and Greek words and some of it, you know, I'm having to look up what does that word in English mean, you know, because there's such like scholars, but almost everyone in this instance, when they talk about Thomas's phrase, they mention one thing that most of us in this room can relate to. Thomas is Eeyore, okay? <laughs> And now almost every one of them is amazing. Like, you know, this scholar from Cambridge writes, you know, and Thomas is the Eeyore, you know, like Eeyore, Eeyore's everywhere, you know, but it's like, let us also go. We're going to die with him. So, so they're off. 
And so they all think they're heading to their death. I mean, these guys, you know, Jesus, I, you know, it's amazing how patient Jesus is with them. And, and then, of course, you realize how knuckleheaded we are. It's amazing how patient he is with us. So verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now this means that most likely after, the, after they came to Jesus, Lazarus died right after that. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Now, four days, again, he's been dead since probably right after Jesus heard news that he was sick. Also, it's important the word four days is in here. John's going to tell us twice this is here. There was a common Jewish belief that the soul kind of hung around the body for three days. And by the fourth day, you were really dead. The soul had departed. John's going to mention this twice because he wants his readers to realize that Lazarus truly is dead. This is not going to be a story of resuscitation. Now, in verse 18, you see, it, it says that it, it, was, it was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. So the thought, and many of the Jews had come. So many of their family had come. This wasn't, you know, it's very close to Jerusalem. But also in Jewish funerals, they would have hired professional mourners. They would have hired at least two flute players. And formal mourning lasted for seven days. So he's been dead for four days, but he was put in the tomb on the day he died. But for the next seven days, there's going to be this period of mourning called the Shabba. And they're in that right now. And family members, professional mourners, flute players, all these things were happening. Verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Don't you love her honesty? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You ever prayed something like that? I mean, God, if you had shown up, this wouldn't have happened. Lord, if you had been here, if you'd answered my prayer, this would not have happened. Now, it's interesting she has this next statement in verse 22, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, most people, scholars think that she's not asking for resurrection, that she's just saying, you know, I don't mean any disrespect, that I know that you can do all things. And so she said this. She's very honest. So Jesus says an interesting response. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And the common belief for the Hebrews were is that at the end of time, when, when, when God brings you know, Israel to its, its greatest moment, that there will be this resurrection and the resurrection of all the dead and God's people will live with him uh, forever. And Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This, of course, again, is one of the seven I am statements. Probably, you know, I mean, I don't know. Each one you could say is probably like the greatest or most profound. But this is pretty amazing. I am the resurrection, the life. Not I am the power source of resurrection. Not I am the power source of life. But I am the resurrection and I am the life. I'm the source of all life. And if you believe in me, though you die, you shall live. In fact, he says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, obviously, he must not be talking about just physical death, but more on that later. And he asks her, he asks her do you believe this? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who's coming into the world. So this amazing statement, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. You know, he just says this incredible, you know, do you believe this? She says yes. So then the scene changes, verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but still was in the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb and weep there. This was most likely family members or those professional like mourners and that, that I told you about just a minute ago. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, just the honesty, same thing that Martha said. But then look at this. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could, he not, he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? So Martha's come to him. If you had been here, Lord, but Jesus says he will rise. I'm the resurrection and life. Mary comes now. And when when Mary says the exact same thing, if you had been here. And something happens here in this exchange. And, and, you know, it doesn't tell us exactly that, you know, Jesus, you know, Martha was formal. It's not the whole Martha was formal and Mary was, you know, very much more personal to him. It doesn't say that. It just says that when he saw her weeping and it saw all the, the Jews who had come with her weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Now that phrase, deeply moved, is one word in the Greek. It's this long, weird word, embrimomai. And many times when it's written, it refers to a very strange thing. It refers to the snorting of a horse. Now, have you ever spent much time with horses or ever watching Westerns? Uh, but when a horse gets angry, it can snort. Its nostrils flare. And so if you really take this word down, this deeply troubled could also be translated into an outburst of anger. So Mary and Martha come to him. Jesus sees her weeping, sees the Jews weeping, and he has an outburst of anger in his spirit. You can imagine like in, in movies, you've seen this where like, um, you know, like people like, you know, they yell out and they have this outburst of just, you know, they're so upset because of something that's happened. This is what's happening inside Jesus. And then it has the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35. So kids, if you're looking for a verse to memorize, yeah, mom, will you pay me five bucks to memorize the Bible verse? Jesus wept, you know, John eleven thirty-five. 35. So it actually is really Jesus burst into tears. Don't think that, you know, he's just standing there with his stoic face and the little tears running down his eye. No, he, he is upset moved deeply, this outburst of anger and upsetness and deep trouble and bursting into tears. Now, what would bring such an emotion out of Jesus? Death. Because death is an enemy. Death is not our friend. Death may seem like, well, now someone's suffering's over and I'm glad, but that's bittersweet because you know in the first place they never should have suffered. That sickness, pain, suffering is all in our world because our world is broken and fallen because sin has entered the world since Genesis chapter 3. Death brings anger and heartbreak, heartbreak to the heart of Jesus. The wages of sin is death and all of us are heading toward death and Jesus is not okay with that. John is giving us a picture of when Jesus goes to funerals, he's not happy about it. He's not glib about it. He, he grieves. He's, he's upset and he's angry. He is not indifferent to what's happening around him. And the same truth is true today because Hebrews tells us Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today forever. Jesus is not indifferent to the human condition. He still isn't today. He is still moved. He is still harbor. He is still moving and bringing life to people. And one day when he returns, 1 Corinthians tells us, death, the final enemy, will be defeated, gone forever. So verse 38, then Jesus, 
deeply moved again. We'll come back to that phrase. Came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Now, verse 38, that deeply moved, it's the same word, the outburst of anger. So Jesus has this outburst of anger within. And what happens? He walks toward the tomb. So to get a picture of what Jesus is thinking about, I I need you to think about um, the fact that that Jesus has probably gone now. He probably has, it's that aspect of, I'm so upset and I can't let this just stand by. I can't stand by and watch this happen. This moment of anger has now has him in movement. I mean, basically, Jesus has now gone to pick a fight with death. This is the Jedi igniting his lightsaber. This is the gunfighter saying, let's take this outside. For all you movie buffs, I tried to hit all generations here. It's John Wayne telling Lucky Ned Pepper to fill his hands. It's William Wallace going to pick a fight. It's Katniss saying, I volunteer as tribute. And very currently, it's Hopper grabbing the sword and going after the the Demogorgon. It is Jesus walking to the tomb and saying, get your hands off my friend. You can't have him right now. And they're all freaking out. You can't open the tomb. He's been dead for four days. There's there's an odor. If you look up the King James Version in verse 39, uh, Martha literally says, he stinketh. Okay? (laughs) But in verse 41, so they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. What an amazing prayer. And it's worth stopping and saying and worth just focusing, uh, taking our attention off the main drama of the story and just talking about his prayer for a second. That scripture defines a Christian as being in Christ. The Apostle Paul, when he describes who a Christian is, uh, more than any other phrase he uses in his writings, he uses the phrase in Christ, that what's true about Jesus is now true about a Christian. That we, in fact, we said this last week in, in the message, that we can have the same intimacy with the Father now because of Jesus's life, death, and resurrection paying for our sins. We can have the same intimacy with the Father that Jesus has. So we can say in our hearts, that he's heard us. You may not feel like he's heard you, but he's heard you. In fact, if you're in Christ, he always hears you. Do you pray like that? Do you remember that I am in, because of Christ, my Father in heaven always hears me? Really changes a thought about our intimacy with God. Now back to the drama. Verse 43. When he had said these things, He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died, I love that, the man who had died. It's like, you know, who else would have been? Came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him. Him go. Charles Spurgeon has a famous quote saying that he had to specify Lazarus come out or every dead person in the area would have come out. He had to specify that. And this is Jesus showing, I am the resurrection and the life. I can call people out of death and back to life. Amazing story. One of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John. I don't even know if I did it justice. Let's read it all again, and I'll talk about it again. No, I won't do that. But what are some of the implications from this story for us? Well, number one, belief in Jesus means that death is defeated. And what do we mean by that? It means that we don't have to have a fear of death. Most people still say like their number one, when you talk about like number one fears people have when people answer these surveys of fears, you know, spiders and, you know, um, dark places, heights or whatever, usually near the top of the list in the top five is still death. 
In fact, if you read a lot of like analysis, psychological analysis of our country and really the world over the last couple of years through all this, all this pandemic mess with COVID-19, that one of the things that really rose up in many, many people was not a fear of getting sick, but a fear of death. Because people get sick all the time. But now there was this heightened fear that either we or someone we love would get sick and die. For the follower of Jesus, we know that death does not have the last word. The Apostle Paul says the sting of death is gone. What is the sting of death? That life is over and that there's, that's the end of the story. Now, there's no sting for a follower of Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, the scripture says. It's appointed man once to die and then the judgment. Everyone lives forever somewhere. But belief in Jesus means that the sting of death, like there's, there's nothing good left for me, is gone. Only good is ahead for the Christian. Now, does that mean we're glib about death or we're like, I don't care about death. I, I welcome death and all that. Death is not your friend. We don't welcome the wages of sin. That's why life is so precious. That's why if you ever have a thought of harming yourself, or you have the thought, I have nothing to live for, it's not a thought from God. That is a satanic, evil thought that we read last week. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. You have much to live for. Your story's not over. Death is an enemy, and, and do, not, do not play around with it. But we don't have to fear it. This is why so many followers of Jesus could go to their death because of their faith. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German pastor who was imprisoned for his conspiring with others to um, bring down Adolf Hitler, he's in this prison on the last day of his life, he's to be hung. And one man writes that on the last day uh, that he, would, he got up and did his morning prayers, that he had his normal sweet disposition. And the last written words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that's found that he wrote the day they took him to hang him was, this is the end, but for me, the beginning of life. How could he have that? How could he have that peace? Because he knew death was defeated. He can follow Jesus all the way to the end. Second implication is resurrection is our destiny. Resurrection is our destiny. The resurrection is coming for all Christians. Scripture is clear. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about how that we will all have these resurrected bodies, purified from sin. What will they look like? I don't know. What will they be like? I don't know. Will you, will you have your dream body? I don't know. Will I have hair? Who knows? You know? <laughs> But I tell you what, it, it won't have the effects of sin. So whatever that means. And you and I cannot imagine a human body that has not been affected by sin. We don't have that capability. Our imaginations aren't that great. We try in our movies, but we just can't do it. I mean, Christ is even called the first fruits of the resurrection. His resurrected body is the first of what's coming for all of us. This is the living hope of the Christian. It's not that, oh yeah, my body will be dead and my soul will just float around forever in heaven. No, no. Yes, I'll be with the Lord. But when Jesus returns, I will have a resurrected body. And the life I live forever in the kingdom of God is in a body, in a place with him at the center. Resurrection is our destiny. Third implication Believe in Jesus' resurrection power. If Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, there's nothing he can't do. Now, we have to be honest that Jesus didn't resurrect everyone. We know he resurrected a boy that had died and gave him back to his mother. We know he resurrected a girl that had died and gave her back to his father. And we know he resurrected Lazarus. I believe that's all the resurrections that Jesus did. There's some resurrections in Acts. It's not like there's a resurrection on every page. And those miracles are signs of this is what the kingdom of God does. It obliterates death. But remember, all three of those people, the girl, the boy, Lazarus, they're dead today. They did not resurrect into glorified bodies. They are not here today. 
But because Jesus has resurrection power, we believe that he can do things in our lives that, that anything is possible. So I don't know if there's something dead in your life right now. Maybe your marriage, maybe a relationship. But if you could give that to him, he could speak words of life and transform that. He can bring his resurrection power to any relationship. If you feel like just kind of hope in you has kind of died, he can resurrect that hope. He can bring life where there is death. And that leads us to our last implication. Lazarus's resurrection is a picture of our spiritual life. Lazarus's resurrection is a picture of our spiritual life. And what do I mean by that? Well, three things we see about Lazarus. Number one, he was dead. And every human being when they're born, is spiritually dead. They're physically alive, but they're spiritually dead. This is how people are described before they meet Jesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you were dead in the trespasses in sin. This is written to Christians, so it's in the past tense. But if, it's, if you're not a Christian, it's the present tense. Not that non-Christians are bad people, someone that's not part of the Christian faith, oh, they're awful, we don't, no, no, they're spiritually dead. Their relationship with God has been cut off. It's spiritually dead. It's not that they're in need of improvement, they're in need of life. It's not that they're drowning and Jesus is a life preserver, but that they're dead in the water. They've already drowned in sin, spiritually. It's not that they don't need to become good, they need to become alive. Jesus brings spiritual life. He, he resurrects. He, he brings new spiritual life when we put our faith in people. And maybe the, the greatest thing that can happen to you today is you have this awakening where you realize, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to try to be good. I need Jesus to bring my heart alive to him. I need to come alive to him. And how do you come alive to him? Well, one, right now you're probably hearing him call you. He's calling your name out of the tomb of sin. And you respond by surrendering your life to him. So if you have any inkling, any drawing, anything happening in you, you're just like, yeah, I need to get, I need to surrender my life to Jesus. That is him calling you out of the tomb of spiritual death. He was dead. We're dead without Christ spiritually. He was, Lazarus was then disabled. Did you see at the end, uh, verse 44, it says, the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. Now, according to Jewish custom, a body would not have been fully mummified, but uh, it would have been wrapped, with, uh, wrapped around with large linen cloths and tied with the hands and feet, and there would have been a cloth around his face to keep the jaw in place. So him coming out of the tomb, he would have been shuffling and hopping out. It, it might have kind of looked ridiculous, except the fact that he was dead and now he was alive. And so they were probably too, like, you know, spellbound to think he was ridiculous. And so what does Jesus says? He says something so practical, unbind him and let him go. I mean, that is a spiritual picture of the whole Christian life. That we're, if you're a Christian, you're spiritually alive to God in Christ. He has made you alive to him. And for the rest of our lives, we are just being unbound from the effects of sin in our life. We're just trying to experience more and more of the freedom that Jesus paid for, to live more and more of the life Jesus paid for. And there's stuff in our hearts, there's stuff in our lives that are still bound up, that it's disabled by sin. There's, there's sections of us that Jesus is constantly, let's unbind that. Let's take that off. You don't need to be in that anymore. That's the stuff that belongs to dead people. That belongs to spiritual death. You're now in spiritual life. And so we're constantly just taking off the grave clothes of sin, shame, and guilt. For Lazarus, it took just a couple of minutes. For you and me, it's our whole life. And I know there's parts of my heart and parts of my faith that are still bound up that just need to be unbound so I can experience more of the life Jesus came to give me. Ephesians talks about it with a different metaphor. In Ephesians 4, and 24, it says that we were told to put off our old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, create after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So put off the old self, that would be the grave clothes and put on the new self, this new life that Jesus has come to give us. I love the fact that 
If you notice back in verse 44, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I do think, friends, that there is a measure of freedom and spiritual growth in our lives that we cannot have unless we are in relationship with other Christians. There's nothing like spiritual community in the local church. What it's supposed to do, it's not just to have buddies. It's not just to have people to share you know, meals with when you're sick or have a baby. It's not just you know, uh, to have someone work, serve in the nursery. It is to have fellow believers that help unbind each other through prayer and confession, and encouragement. It's be a life-giving community that helps each other get unbound from sin and live in the freedom that Christ provides. So there's dead, there's disabled, and disabled, of course, is a kind of a continuum. It's kind of like a parts of my heart. It's not like I'm always, you're always hopping around everything. And then another big category we see then from Lazarus's life is dangerous. Now, you didn't see that there. You don't see it till chapter 12. So we're going to skip ahead to chapter 12, verses 9 through 11. When a large crowd learned that Jesus was there, Jesus is back in Bethany visiting Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and we'll read part of this story next week. They came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I mean, you'd probably want to see that. That was the guy that was dead. He came back to life. I got questions, you know. I mean, I mean, now they'd be on like Oprah. You know, Oprah would be interviewing them, or you know, they'd be on some big show. And of course, you know, now turn out later it was probably fake. But but Lazarus, you know, is like it's not fake. We were all there. There's all these eyewitnesses and all that kind of stuff. And so look at verse ten. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So people are believing in Jesus, so let's kill Lazarus too. What was Lazarus doing? He was just being alive. He was just living. He was just living an unbound, fully alive life. What's a dangerous Christian? It's someone that, well, it's, it's just, you know, they preach on street corners or they're, or, or they're missionaries or, or in other countries or they're, they're the super Christians. No, dangerous Christians are just fully alive men and women in Christ who let that life flow out of them. That's a dangerous Christian. You're a threat to the kingdom of darkness if you just live like your heart's been unbound to God. And you just live a life of love and peace and joy. And by love, I mean just sacrificial love in the world. You're, you're, not, you're not thrown off by this world. You have a sense of peace and joy. You speak truth. You don't spin it. You don't twist it. it you, don't, you don't argue. You don't get caught up in all the things. Well, you're just living fully alive to God. That's a dangerous Christian right there. A dangerous Christian is someone fully alive in Jesus. Because when you're resurrected and you have new life in Christ you've been taken out of the kingdom of darkness and it's not for you just to sit around and live your best life here it is for you to be fully alive to Jesus and help other people come to know him it's letting his life flow through you so if you have this continuum of disabled to dangerous if you can bring that up for me and dangerous by we mean fully alive where would you be? And maybe there's different parts of you. Maybe there's parts of you. Maybe there's some attitudes and some relationships. That that, it's a little more, it's bound up. You got some unforgiveness. And you need Jesus. Jesus, I need your help to unbind me in these areas. I need, I need some help. I need some healing. You need to find some people in community to talk to about, can you pray for me about this? I, I, I've got some disability happening in my heart right here. I'm not functioning like I'm meant to in Christ. Maybe there's other parts of your heart. Man, I, I feel fully alive here. And I, and I want to be more fully alive. I feel Maybe you like in your finances, you know what? I feel fully alive. I don't feel like finances have this big hold on me now. Okay, Lord, what's my next step with that? Uh, how can I share more? How can I resource more? How can I be more generous? I don't know. This is a great thing to sit down and just kind of pray through. Where are the parts of my heart that are disabled, that are bound up? And where are the parts of my heart that are fully alive? And how can I be even more fully alive? Because we're, we're, you know, we're always going to struggle with sin. We're going to be un being unbound for the rest of our lives because the effects of sin are, are still on these bodies and still in our hearts. 
But the power of Christ is greater than that. So where are you? There's parts that say, thank you. I feel alive here. I want greater life in you. And there's parts probably to say, help me. I need you to unbind me. I need, I need to get in community and pray and talk to people about this. So where are you in that? And so if you took the three, where are you? If Lazarus' resurrection is a picture of our spiritual life, where are you? Are you spiritually dead and you need to come alive to Christ? Is there some spiritual disability? Maybe it's a great disability. Maybe there's just some sin right now that's got you so bound up. You are not walking in life with the Lord. And today you just need to confess that. And by His Spirit, He'll take that off of you. Because that's just, that's just dead man's clothes. That's just dead people's clothes. You don't need to have that on your heart. Or maybe you know there's parts of your life that are, that are alive, but, but they're not fully alive. They're not thriving. They're not pushing back. They're not pushing back darkness. And you need to make a move toward that. Where are you today? Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, that raised Lazarus from the dead, is in you by the Holy Spirit to help you live a more fully alive life in Christ. And that doesn't mean fully alive life in Christ. I don't have any problems and everything goes my way. You're probably going to have problems and things aren't going to go your way. Lazarus was fully alive and someone was plotting his death. You might be fully alive in Christ, but some, there's still a plot against you. The evil one has his eye on you. But don't be afraid. It just means greater is he who is in you than he who is of the world, John tells us. So where are you? Dead? Disabled? Or dangerous? Let's pray and respond to what he says to us. If you were this morning, you're realizing, you know what, I think I'm spiritually dead. We're, we, we're going to put this prayer on the screen. Called, we call it the prayer of belief. And it just helps put words into what's going on in our heart. What's going on in your heart is Jesus is telling you to come out of the grave of sin. What's going on in your heart is you're wanting to surrender to Jesus and say, yes, I give my life to you. But sometimes we don't have the words. You can just use these words, make them your words. And you just do that right now. Give your heart to him. Come out. Give your heart. Give your life. Surrender. Say, yes, Jesus. I receive your life now. I receive your life. Is there a scenario right now where you know there's some, so some you're, you're kind of bound up and you just need to say, Jesus, would you unbind me? What do you need to confess to him right now? Maybe you just need to put your palms in your lap, just palms up, not toward me, but just as a sign of the Lord. Lord, I need to receive just your life right now. I need to receive more of that freedom right now you died to give me. Because I'm bound up in this. I'm, I'm bound up in my, some really impure thoughts. I'm bound up in some, some angst and anxiety. I'm bound up in in unforgiveness. I need your help. I need your life. Would you help me, Lord? Would you, Holy Spirit, would you help me experience the life that Jesus died to give me? You know, there are areas of your life you need to be more fully alive in. You're like, Lord, I feel there's life here, but I want to be more fully alive. I want to be fully alive in my generosity me move fully alive and how I sacrificially serve people throughout the week. I'm going to be more fully alive and dangerous to the kingdom of darkness by being open to share my faith. What can you ask him about? What can you talk to him about when it comes to that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we acknowledge your presence in this room. I want to ask you now to make it tangible to us. Help us to be aware of your felt presence, of your life. For some in the room, it's about saying yes to you and receiving your life for the first time. 
for others of us that just were bound up in some areas. And I pray for those who just who are sensing that, Lord. I pray that what they're asking, how they're asking you to unbind them right now, you would answer their prayer. Come upon us now and do that work in our heart. Lord, where we're fully alive, pour, pour gasoline on that fire. Stoke the flames that are in our hearts. Lord, help us to be the kind of community that unbinds each other, that loves each other, that gives grace and truth, that prays for each other. Help us to be the kind of community that believes in resurrection power, that the same Jesus that called Lazarus out of the tomb is calling people out of tombs today, the tomb of their sin, shame, sorrow, and guilt. And Father, May we have great hope that one day death will be completely gone. It will be the last enemy thrown away and we will live with you, the one true God, the resurrection and the life. We worship you now. We give our hearts to you. We ask you to keep, have your way with us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing this song together.